Let me have you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 16. Acts, chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, and we're going to begin there with verse 16. Acts 16, and beginning at verse 16. And it came to pass, <clears throat> excuse me, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, this is Luke writing, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God which show unto us the way of salvation. Now she was mocking them. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that their hope, that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the Magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes, that's Paul and Silas's clothes, and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison, and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. Now, we uh, uh, can safely assume uh, the penalty for losing the prisoners would have been death anyway. So he figured, I'll uh, save uh, my master some time, just kill myself. Verse 28, But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. I'm going to stop reading right there. In this story, God has just wrought another miracle and the jailer recognized it. All the doors of the prison were opened, yet none of the uh, inmates had escaped. Uh, you know, they say the abiding thought in the mind of every new jail inmate is the word escape. He's trying to figure out how can I possibly get out of this place. And when he discovered that the doors were open, and everyone's bands and their stocks had been loosed, and yet nobody was gone, he knew a great miracle had just taken place. And it was a uh, miracle that got them thrown into prison, casting the unclean spirit out of the woman, and now it's going to be a miracle that gets them out of prison. And today I'm going to expand on a gospel track, excuse me, a gospel track that Dr. Ruckman wrote years ago called The Most Important Question. And this jailer asked Paul and Silas, verse 30, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? It's the most important question any unbelieving man or unbelieving woman can ask in any age, in any time. Uh, it's more important than uh, who should I marry? It's uh, a more important question than what kind of career should I pursue? It's more important than where should I live? It's certainly more important than who wants to be a millionaire, right? It's more consequential than uh, who's going to win the next uh, presidential election or anything along those lines. Uh, it's the most important question anyone can ask in life. What must I do to be saved? And the answer is not, 
Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 2.38. The answer is not Matthew 24.13, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. No matter what any other religion or any cult might want to say. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, in verse 37, nobody asked, what shall we do to be saved? Read it very carefully. That question is nowhere to be found in Acts chapter 2. So their answer in verse 38 won't help anybody. In Matthew chapter 24, the context is the Lord Jesus preaching about those who will endure to the end of the tribulation. But someone who trusts Jesus Christ to get sa to, for their salvation now, the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, has no fear of facing the tribulation, so that answer won't help him at all. That answer is irrelevant. It's been said that great claims require great evidence or great proof. And I would say, likewise, a great question <laughs> deserves a great answer. So let me consider the most important question. Uh, first of all, point number one, it was a polite question. It's prefaced with the word sirs. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? In this age, nobody has any manners, right? Nobody's got any class. Now, you see it, you hear it all around you if you're just paying attention. Uh, no, very few kids today, I should not say no, but very, very few kids, young people today, know how to say yes, sir, yes, ma'am, please, thank you, I'm sorry, please forgive me, that was my fault. Well, they can drop the F-bomb and curse words and swear words without hesitation. Now, just listen to them all around you. And they can barely read and write, thanks to a failing public education system. Their language skills, such as they are, spelling, grammar, vocabulary, syntax, uh, have all been replaced with emojis, you know, O-N-G, L-O-L, my BFF, that's my best friends forever, right? And uh, a bunch of other abbreviations for all kinds of curse words, which I won't even mention today. And you see these same kinds of people speeding in and out of traffic, weaving in and out of lanes, uh, no indicator, so you have no idea what they're about to do. And, uh, and they're still texting on their phones while they're driving. Lately, I've been watching, just recently, I've been watching some videos on YouTube, dash cam videos taken from the, the, the dashboard of a big rigs. And I like those because I like seeing some little car pull right in front of that, of that semi and then put their, step on their brakes. And a guy in, a, in an 18-wheeler with 100,000 pounds of freight uh, in that trailer cannot stop on a dime. And I like seeing it when he smashes into the back of the car in front of him. There's something oddly satisfying about watching that. And he pushes that car out of the road or off the road, and, or the car turns sideways, and he ends up pushing the car down the road for about a half mile. There's something uh, wonderful about seeing that. Uh, now, if you are a driver, don't do that. Use some sense. Use the brain God put in your head. Yep. Now, if you happen to do that, and you get hit by a big rig behind you, I pray to the Lord you survive it. But just know this, your pastor will be cheering for the other guy. <laughs> Something uniquely rewarding about seeing somebody get what they deserve. But you have to give the language of the King James Bible credit in this verse because this man's question was a polite question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? It was a polite question when you contrast his response to having hearing, heard the singing, probably, and the earthquake, and the miracle, and the band, everyone's bands loosed, everyone, all the doors of the prison open, and nobody gone. When you contrast his response to what he saw and heard with the response people give today. You walk up to somebody on the street corner or at work, you just simply offer them a, a gospel tract to read when they have time to read it. Oh, no, thank you. I don't believe in discussing religion. Or we actually go to church, but so, so no, thank you. Uh, you have your beliefs, we have ours, and we don't believe in trying to talk somebody out, out of their religion. They act like that track is going to jump up and hurt them, right? And, uh, and I've said this before, they don't throw it on the ground because they're unsure of what's in it. They know what's in it! That's why they throw it on the ground. 
And so this man's response to everything he saw and heard was much more polite than the response you get from people today. They're not interested in their own soul. They're not interested in their own uh, destiny. They're not interested in asking the most important question. And their immediate knee-jerk reaction when they hear the gospel is to try and deflect and change the subject. And it's only getting worse. In this age where uh, anything you say to someone might set them off because it's not politically correct or you hurt their feelings, the very suggestion of hell and guilt and sin and God's coming judgment, you're liable to cause a riot. Right now, people are generally just rude. Well, let's check back in a year and see. They, they, they've probably lost their minds and need mental help. This man's question, however, was a polite question. Secondly, let me say this. It was a practical question. The most practical question is not who is going to the Super Bowl this year. The most practical question is not uh, is there life on other planets. The most practical question is not did we really go to the moon, all those conspiratorial uh, subjects. The most practical question is not are they going to raise taxes on us this year. What other direction do the taxes go in? They never go down. The most practical question is not uh, who's going to be the big winner at the Academy Awards. People spend a lot of time uh, on things that are completely pointless and worthless and useless. What could be more practical than getting ready to face God one day when you die? God told Israel, uh, uh, Amos 4 verse 12, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. The Bible says, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God, Romans 14, verse 12. You can't escape it. You can't avoid it. But someday you're going to die, and you know you're going to die. So it behooves you to make preparations for that time. As I said, I think recently, maybe last week, never put off till tomorrow what you ought to do today. And so it was a practical question in that respect. But it was also practical from a human standpoint in that if you think there's something you can do to please God, if you think there's something you can do to get God's attention or to earn your way into heaven, more than likely you're going to set about and try and do it. And that's the whole basis, the whole motive behind uh, man's religions. Try to figure out what, what we think God wants us to do and then attempt to fulfill it. Now you might spend your time and your energy doing things that, are, that will avail nothing. They'll, they'll be completely worth, worthless effort. It won't benefit you at all. You may be going down a dead-end street thinking you're on your way to heaven. But from a human standpoint, at least you're trying, right? So he asked, what must I do? It was a practical question. Thirdly, let me say this. Uh, it was a personal question. He asked, what must I do? do to be saved. Suddenly he wasn't throwing up objections like, well, what about people in other countries that have never heard the gospel before? Uh, how, can, how can you say that, that uh, you're right and they're wrong or they're lost because they've never heard your preacher or anything like that? Uh, he was worried about himself. Suddenly he wasn't throwing up diversionary questions. Well, how can you say you're right and everybody else is wrong? Or how can there be a loving God, as you claim, when there's so much suffering in the world? When someone gets under the convicting power of God, he's worried about himself. He really cares about himself. And so was this man. He asked, um, although he asked, uh, what must I do to be saved? And their answer, verse 31, was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And then they add, and thy house he wasn't asking about his household. He was asking about himself. People get very um, self-centered when it comes to the saving of their soul. Because they're the, they call themselves number one, right? Everybody says, you're number one. So when, they, when it comes to the saving of their soul, they're, they're looking out for number one. They care about what's going to happen to them. At least if they're under genuine conviction by God, he asked about himself. Um, the Jews' question to the disciples, Acts chapter 2, was, What must we do? Sir, uh, uh, men and brethren, what shall we do? But there was no we in this jailer's question. He said, What must I do to be saved? 
He wanted to know what he needed to do to get right with God. And just because your parents might be Christians doesn't mean you are. You know, it's been said before, uh, and our, our, I've said it before, nobody can do your praying for you. Nobody can do your Bible reading for you. And, and more importantly, nobody can get saved for you. That's something you're going to have to d make up between you and the Lord. If you're not worried about your own soul, if you're not worried about your own uh, destiny one day when you die, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your life. Your life is going to amount to nothing. You're going to wake up in hell, uh, having wasted all the time, all the chances and opportunities God ever sent to you. If you don't avail yourself of the gospel right now and believe it, you're wasting your life. Life is short. Death is sure. Sin the curse, but Christ the cure. It's easy to find fault with other people. It's easy to point out their sins and their failings. But are you willing to admit your own? That's a necessary component. Could you be honest enough before God, before the world, before the universe to admit there's something wrong with you? You need to be saved. Not my father, not my mother, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. The most important question is a personal question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Fourthly and lastly today, it was a powerful question. A sinner's eternal destiny depends on getting the right answer to this question. If the answer is wrong, your destination will be wrong. And you only have one lifetime, one chance to get it right. That should be a sobering thought in itself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27 tells us. And uh, Job certainly understood this. Job 7, verses 8, 9, and 10. The eye of him that hath seen me shall see me no more. Thine eyes are upon me, and I am not. As the cloud is consumed and vanisheth away, so he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him any more. By the way, that's also a good set of verses to use in arguing against reincarnation. If you ever run into somebody who believes in that. Job 16, verse 22. When a few years are come, then I shall go the way whence I shall not return. So you only have one chance to get it right. The most important question is a powerful question because of the consequences and getting the wrong answer. Satan has offered a, a, a plethora of wrong answers so he can take more souls to, to hell with him. Some people think the answer is in Matthew 16. Behold, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. So you ought to join the Catholic Church to be saved. That's the wrong answer. Some people think the answer is in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, etc., so you live a, need to live a life of good deeds, uh, good works, uh, to be saved. That's the wrong answer. Some people think you simply uh, ought to love other people. Derived from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the so-called love chapter. That's the wrong answer too. You cannot love something without having a corresponding hatred of something else. That's what gives love its definition. And uh, when people say, uh, just love everybody, show love to everybody. What they really mean is tolerate my sin and don't criticize me. That's what they mean. Some people run to 1 Peter 3, verse 21 for the answer. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. So you should get baptized in water to be saved. That's the wrong answer. The rest of that verse says that baptism is merely the answer of a good conscience toward God. So water baptism in anybody's water can't save you. The Apostle Paul would later write, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Romans 1.16 The Philippian jailer asked the most important question. And Paul and Silas gave him the most important answer. 
believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And then they added, and thy house, which simply means the same goes for your family. If they believe, they'll be saved too. Uh, the so-called new, updated, improved versions of the Bible read, Believe in the Lord Jesus, NIV. Believe in the Lord Jesus, New American Bible. Believe in the Lord Jesus, New American Standard Version. The word Christ is conspicuously missing from the modern translations. So the connection to the Holy Spirit and the, the, the triune nature of the Godhead is obscured in those modern versions. Modern versions also make a false promise uh, by all reading, you will be saved, you and your household, new ASV. You will be saved along with everyone in your household, new living translation. And what they call covenant theology creeps in and uh, with the idea that if the head of the household, the father, gets saved, all of his children are automatically saved and protected too. That's false. That's false. That's why the Bible says, as I quoted earlier, Romans 14, 12, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And I can't get saved for you, nor can anyone else. But there's a, but there's a subtle distinction between our Bible and their Bibles in the words, believe in something and believe on something or someone. You can believe in the benefits of aspirin uh, in the abstract, but do you believe on it enough to take one when you have a headache? See the, the subtle distinction between those two terms? In one sense, you can claim to believe in Jesus as a member of a certain denomination or your particular religious background from a distance, you can believe in Jesus, but do you believe on him enough to trust him alone as your savior? That's the difference. And I'm going to bring this to a close. This has not been very lengthy, but that's all right. The most important question uh, concerns your eternity. It was a polite question. It was a practical question. It was a personal question. And it's a powerful question because you need the right answer to it. And that will determine where you spend eternity. Men seem to think that God has these set of cosmic scales out there and he's going to weigh your good deeds against your bad deeds. And however the scales tip in one direction or the other will determine where you spend eternity. That's not it at all. Uh, salvation comes by trusting what Christ had done for you. Not trusting anything you can do in and of yourself. But trusting what he's done for you and the price he paid for your salvation, meaning, namely his own blood on the cross of Calvary, and you will be saved.